Well, hello, and thank you to the organizers inviting me to give an update on our research in MSA here at Mayo. My name is Wolfgang Singer. I'm a associate professor of neurology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I have a longstanding interest in MSA and related disorders. I'm planning to do two things today, namely first cover updates of our work on spinal fluid markers to help with an earlier diagnosis, and then give you an update on our work on stem cells as a disease modifying treatment. We are now in the midst of a phase two efficacy trial, and I plan to go over the rationale for doing this, the study design, and the trial timeline. At this time, the diagnosis of MSA is still mainly based on patient symptoms and the impression of a skilled neurologist, which receives guidance from consensus criteria that experts in the field have agreed on, and you just heard about their recent revision. There are currently available tests that can help support the diagnosis, which include autonomic function testing, as well as imaging studies, such as MRI and DAT scans, but characteristic findings are often not present until the disease has already progressed to a later disease stage. And therefore, it is not really surprising that the diagnosis of MSA usually does not happen until years after symptom onset, when the disease is often already rather advanced. I'm sure you all know about the long list of failed trials that aimed at slowing disease progression in MSA. And I've listed some of the larger ones here, which do include one exception, and that is a Korean trial using stem cells. My team at Mayo has since become quite interested in the use of patients' own stem cells, and we have pursued our own studies using this approach, which I will cover in some more detail in a few minutes. It is important to note that the long list of failed trials in MSA is really intriguing in that there's good scientific rationale for these agents and concern has rightfully been raised that these trials may have failed because patients are diagnosed too late when the disease has already progressed too far for these therapies to actually take effect. And that aligns the notion that better tests to help in making the diagnosis more securely at an earlier stage are truly needed. And exactly that has been the focus of my team's work in recent years as we explored various potential diagnostic markers in the spinal fluid of patients with MSA. I covered this topic at this conference last time, so I will focus on the main findings and more recent updates here today. Of the markers we studied, it turned out that there were two particularly intriguing. The first one is called neurofilament light chain or NFL which has been shown to be elevated in other neurologic disorders as well. Uh, and it is those with very fast disease progression. And um, that marker allows us to measure the degree of nerve cell damage. In over 120 well-characterized patient samples, we could show that this marker not only provided perfect separation from healthy control subjects, which is shown here on the left, but also separated patients with MSA almost perfectly from related conditions such as Parkinson's disease and certain dementias. And that's shown here on the right. The other remarkable disease marker we found is the detection of misfolded alpha-synuclein protein, which ultimately underlies the pathophysiology of MSA. Now, this was initially pioneered by uh, colleagues in Texas using technology that allows us to detect misfolded protein by mimicking in the while the progressive accumulation of misfolded protein that happens in the brain. Now, we found in our large cohort that this assay resulted in abnormal protein aggregation only in patients with MSA, Parkinson's, 
and certain dementias, but not in healthy controls. But even more importantly, the aggregation was different between MSA samples and the other conditions, and that allowed us to separate them completely. Now, new since my last update is that we expanded these studies to patients who only had autonomic symptoms, but no Parkinsonism or balance problems. In other words, they were at risk of developing MSA or similar conditions, but did not fulfill diagnostic criteria yet. And we followed them over time. Now you can see that there's five patients out of 32, and those are indicated here with red dots that had markedly elevated NFL levels at that early stage and also showed abnormal protein aggregation at that stage, suggestive of MSA. And all five later developed MSA and none of the other patients did. Based on that, we concluded that we have two markers that alone and in combination have diagnostic value for MSA that may be superior to any other currently available marker. And that our findings really go beyond disease confirmation and allow prediction of a future MSA diagnosis before the disease actually is fully developed. We do believe that these markers have important implications, not only for disease confirmation and prognosis, but also for future trials of disease modifying therapies, which now could be tested at a much earlier stage. Now, the second part of this talk will focus on telling you some more about our currently ongoing phase two study of mesenchymal stem cells. And I will cover the rationale, study design, and the timeline. A research group around Philly in Seoul, Korea, reported back in 2009 significant benefit of mesenchymal stem cells in MSA in an open label study, which later was followed up by a randomized placebo controlled trial with the hypothesis that mesenchymal stem cells can slow disease progression in MSA through their ability to differentiate into different cell types, including glia-like cells or uh, neuron supporting cells that can secrete factors that we call neurotrophic factors, and by doing so have neuroprotective effects. That rationale was previously suggested also based on preclinical studies in a mouse model of MSA. Now that group randomized patients to receive intra-arterial injections of stem cells into the carotid and the dominant vertebral arteries. And that was followed by IV infusions. And those patients were then compared to patients who underwent sham procedures or basically placebo procedures. And the study showed indeed slower disease progression in the actively treated patients. Now this trial therefore represents the first and thus far only controlled interventional trial in MSA that actually showed efficacy. And in an editorial, this uh, intervention was called a potentially important step forward with intriguing mechanistic potential but there were also concerns, a number of concerns actually expressed. Those concerns were that the study was small, that the study was limited to patients with MSAC. Um, there were also no significant findings when they looked specifically at patient symptoms and function. And also there were concerns about those cells um, crossing the blood brain barrier. But most importantly, there were safety concerns in that over 30% of patients were found to have ischemic lesions on MRI or mini strokes, uh, likely related to the intra arterial injections. Now, we were intrigued enough by the rationale and the findings 
that we decided to pursue our own studies of mesenchymal stem cells in MSA, but we went with what we thought would be a safer route of cell delivery, namely injections of cells directly into the spinal fluid through lumbar puncture. At least in theory, this has the additional advantages of solving the problem of crossing the blood-brain barrier, and also provides more widespread access to the central nervous system, which is important because we know that important pathology is present not only in the brain, but also in the spinal cord. Now with that, we pursued a dose escalation safety study in 24 patients who received between 10 and 100 million autologous stem cells per injection, and we followed patients for 12 months. Our primary aim with that study was to assess safety and tolerability, but we also included measures of efficacy and target engagement. We found that the approach is safe and well-tolerated at the low and medium dose, and found problems with back pain and, and some reactive changes at the injection site at the highest dose level, which we therefore decided to abandon. But most exciting were the clinical efficacy signals we saw with a dose-dependent slower disease progression compared to a matched comparison group taken from our own rifampicin trial. Now these clinical observations were associated with measurable increases of neurotrophic factors in the spinal fluid as we had hypothesized. And when we further analyzed the association, it became clear that the lowest progression rates occurred not with the highest, but with moderate or intermediate levels of these neurotrophic factors. And because of that, we decided to add on an additional cohort to our study to explore a cell dose that's between the original low and medium dose. And that would be 25 million cells per injection. And that dose was very well tolerated with essentially no side effects seen. But on the other hand, there was unusual uh, efficacy signal uh, in that there was virtual arrest of disease progression during the year of observation. Also, we found a significant decline of a marker of axonal degeneration that I've mentioned before, namely neurofilament light chain. And that provided additional biomarker evidence of target engagement and efficacy. We felt that these data provided compelling rationale to develop this approach further. Um, and we feel that we have identified an optimal cell dose and that what we need now is a determination of the optimal dosing frequency as well as obviously blinded efficacy data. And that has led to the design of a phase two trial which received funding support last year through the FDA Orphan Products Grant Program and with additional generous support from Mayo's Department of Regenerative Medicine. And this is what the trial looks like. It is a double-blind, sham-controlled trial, with placebo being the intrathecal injections of lactated ringer solution, basically a salt solution, and the active treatment being 25 million mesenchymal stem cells that are suspended in that lactated ringer solution. The trial uses an adaptive design um, and it starts out with three arms where patients will receive either 25 million cells every three months or they receive 25 million cells every six months and actually get placebo at three and nine months or placebo with each four of the injections. Therefore, there's a two to one chance of receiving the active treatment. Now there will be a recruitment hold after half patients have been injected um, and that will be followed by an interim analysis that will look at futility on the one hand, the need to possibly repower or increase sample size on the other hand. And if everything looks promising, we will pick a winner of the two active arms 
and then resume the study with only two arms, namely the winner active treatment and placebo with a two to one randomization. Now for very compelling logistical and financial reasons, we had to give up the original idea of a multi-center study for, a phase, for the phase two. And instead, we are conducting this study only at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and plan to enroll a total of 76 patients over three years. Now here's a study timeline that gives a sense of the frequency of study visits. There's a screening visit during which a fat biopsy occurs that is followed by an approximately two months of cell production. And then there are four treatment visits at baseline, three months, six months, and nine months. And during those visits, we will also assess various other study endpoints, um, including efficacy. And then there will be a 12 month follow-up visit um, as well. There will also be a one week follow-up visit um, for safety reasons after each treatment, but some of those will be done by phone. The study therefore will require a total of eight in-person visits and the total duration of the study for an individual patient will be about 14 months. Here is the uh, test schedule, just to give you an overview of procedures at each visit, which include clinical outcome measures, blood and spinal fluid collection, and MRI of head and lumbar spine. Now the primary endpoint is the rate of disease progression using the change in the unified MSA rating total score over 12 months. Secondary endpoints include progression in the AMSARS or unified MSA rating scale subscales, progression in an abbreviated AMSARS version that uses selected items of the original AMSARS that reflect clinically most meaningful aspects of the disease that was per FDA guidance. And then we will also look at progression of autonomic symptoms at the rate of atrophy of selected brain regions um, and other measures on MRI. Now, here I have listed the N and exclusion criteria. And just want to emphasize that we are looking to enroll patients up to 70 years old who fulfill criteria for probable MSA, but are still in an early disease stage with an AMSAS-1 score not including the erectile dysfunction uh, item, uh, that should be no higher than 17. And patients also still have to be able to walk unaided. Now, I would like to emphasize here that the requirement of an early disease stage is often frustrating to researchers and, of course, also to patients. But there are compelling reasons to do that. Number one is that it has been shown that the outcome measure that is currently available to us, which is the AMSAR scale, uh, has a ceiling effect, which means that progression appears slower as the disease advances. And that's not because it is, but because the way we can measure disease progression is limited. For example, once a patient is confined to a wheelchair, the item gait has already reached its highest rating and any further progression is not tracked. Also, we have shown in a compassionate extension study to our original stem cell treatment trial in which we have injected patients every six months for several years that the effect of injections seems to wane as the disease progresses. So compelling reasons why we have to be um, so strict with inclusion criteria. And uh, again, I understand how frustrating that is. Lastly, I wanted to emphasize that we have gone through a lot of effort to ensure that blinding of this study is optimized to the extent possible. For every patient and every injection, we actually produce both a stem cell product and a placebo product. 
and randomization will not occur until all release criteria of the cell product are met, which allows us to communicate with the stem cell lab up until the time of injection without risking unblinding. Now the person delivering the cells to the patient's room is blinded and the product arrives in concealed syringes. In terms of clinical blinding, we have complete separation of personnel that assesses and manages adverse events on the one hand and personnel that assesses study outcomes on the other hand. In fact, we have implemented a warning message when a rater of the study by accident accesses a patient's medical record and all such access is traced and will be audited. And we also have procedures in place to ensure complete blinding of the quantitative MRI imaging analysis. And there will be both a blinded and unblinded statistician from different institutions to ensure that data management and analysis are independent of clinical personnel. And here a quick status update as of earlier this month. Um, we enrolled the first patient into the study in late December of last year. And now almost nine months later, we are at a stage where we have enrolled 21 patients of which 16 have already received at least their first treatment. We had no dropouts to this point and we have not seen any serious adverse events. Um, on the right here, you can see the uh, enrollment and injection chart. And as you can see, we have been able to really linearly um, increase the number of patients enrolled. And we hope to continue to do that at a rate of two to three new patients per month, uh, which uh, gets us to an estimated um, time point where we reach uh, enrollment for our interim analysis at May of 2023. So about, uh, yeah, seven, eight months from now. Now, we do want to continue at that rate and definitely welcome referrals, be it physician or self-referrals. We have a very nice study coordinated team um, that can be reached at adcresearch at mayo.edu. Uh, you can also email me directly or call the phone number that's listed here. We get back to everyone who contacts us. Uh, we likely will ask you for more information. We may ask for medical records to review. And from there, may proceed to a video pre-screen visit, or we may invite you for an in-person clinical evaluation first to secure the diagnosis, depending on the situation. I... Uh, Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to answering questions in the live session.